Hey guys, welcome to Command Valley. Today I'm your host Landon, and I'm gonna be bringing you a deck tech. Before I get into today's deck tech, if you're not already subscribed, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss our future deck techs and our future gameplays. Today's deck tech, I'm going to be building Afara, God of the Polis. She is a legendary enchantment creature god that costs two a white and a blue, and she has the typical god text where if your devotion to white is less than seven to blue or white, she is not a creature. And at the beginning of each upkeep, if you had another creature enter the battlefield under your control last turn, you can draw a card. So essentially, if it's your opponent's turn and you had a creature enter the battlefield, during the next upkeep, you get a draw card. So the strategy that I've gone to with this deck is kind of a blink control deck. So we're gonna be blinking creatures, we're gonna be controlling the board and hopefully outvaluing our opponents. And Afara is going to be our card engine to make sure that we don't run out of cards late game and we can hang in until we win. Like always, I break these decks down into several categories that I think are relevant. And the first and probably the most important category is our ramp package. We're playing a number of mana rocks and creatures that we can blink to get some type of ramp effect. So we're playing Knight of the White Orchid, which has first strike and when it enters a battlefield, if an opponent controls more lands than us, we can search our library for a planes card and put it right onto the battlefield and we shuffle our library afterwards. Most of the time our opponents are gonna control more lands than us because white and blue is not very good at putting extra lands into play. Next up, we're playing Boreas Charger. It's a flying Pegasus, and when it leaves the battlefield, we can choose an opponent who controls more lands than us. And we can search our library for a number of planes equal to the difference. We can put one of them onto the battlefield tapped, and the other goes into our hand. Next up, we're playing Solemn Simulacrum, which when it enters the battlefield, we can search our library for a basic land, put it into play, and then when Solemn Simulacrum dies, we get a draw card. So all three of these creatures we can use when they enter the battlefield once, and then with the number of blink spells that we're playing, we can get their effects again and again throughout the game. Next up, we're playing a bunch of mana rocks with Sol Ring, pretty iconic, taps for two, Azorius Signet, we can pay one and add a blue and a white to our mana pool, Thought Vessel gives us no maximum hand size and can add one to our mana pool, Talisman of Progress can tap for a colorless or white and a blue, but it's gonna deal us one damage, Everflowing Chalice we can kick, and each time that we kick it, it enters with the charge counter and it taps equal to the number of charge counters on it. Next up, we have Felwar Stone, which taps to add to our mana pool one mana of any color that a land and opponent controls could produce. We're then playing Wayfarer's Bauble, which for comes in for one mana, we can pay two to sacrifice it to search our library for a basic land, put it right into play and then we shuffle our library. With our ramp out of the way, let's go over some of the ways we have of blinking our creatures. For our one-off blink effect, we're playing Cloud Shift, Ephemerate, Essence Flux, and Momentary Blink. Cloud Shift lets us blink one creature and return it. Ephemerate also does the same thing except for it has Rebound, which is going to let us play Ephemerate again during our upkeep of our next turn. Essence Flux and Momentary Blink also do the same thing of bouncing one creature, but Momentary Blink has the added benefit of having Flashback so we can cast it from our graveyard. Next up, we're playing Illusionist Stratagem, Ghosty Flicker, and Displace, each of which let us blink up to two creatures and immediately return them, with Illusionist Stratagem having the added benefit of letting us draw a card, and Ghostly Flicker also letting us choose artifacts or lands to blink as well. We're then playing Eerie Interlude, which at instant speed, we can exile any number of target creatures we control and immediately return those to the battlefield under our control at the beginning of the next end step. So this is super useful to save our creatures during a board wipe, or maybe we wanna block with all of our creatures and don't want them to die and we can immediately blink them. And then we're playing Restoration Angel, which is a creature with flash and flying. And when it enters the battlefield, we can exile another non-angel we control and immediately return it to the battlefield. With all these blink effects, let's go over some creatures that we want to blink. So we've got creatures that give us a ton of value when they enter the battlefield, and creatures that are going to make our opponent's lives a little bit more difficult when they enter the battlefield or while they're on the battlefield. Going over our value pieces that we want to blink, we've got Karmic Guide, Wall of Omens, Elite Guard Mage, and our Kaomancer. When Karmic Guide enters the battlefield, it's going to let us return a creature from our graveyard to the battlefield, and we have to pay the echo cost of three white white at the beginning of our next upkeep, or else we have to sacrifice Karmic Guide. And then Wall of Omens, when it enters the battlefield, we get to draw a card. Elite Guard Mage, when it enters, we get to draw a card and gain three life. And when our Kaomancer enters the battlefield, we get to return an instant or sorcery from our graveyard to our hand. After those, we're playing Revel Arc, Jeskai Barricade, Peregrine Drake, and Cloud Blazer. When Jeskai Barricade enters the battlefield, we get to return another creature we control to our hand, which then we can play again next turn and maybe get some more value off of it. When Revel Arc leaves the battlefield, we get to return up to two creatures with power two or less from our graveyard directly to the battlefield. And of all the creatures that we're playing in the deck, only five of them are not targets that we could hit with Revel Arc. When Peregrine Drake enters the battlefield, we get to untap up to five lands. And when Cloud Blazer enters the battlefield, we, get, we gain two life and draw two cards. Then we're playing Sun Titan, Seagate Oracle, Watcher for Tomorrow, and Thassa's Oracle. 
Watcher for Tomorrow has Hideaway, which, which says this creature enters the battlefield tapped, and when it does, you look at the top four cards of your library and exile one face down and put the rest on the bottom of your library. And when Watcher for Tomorrow leaves the battlefield, we get to put the card we hideawayed right into our hand. So with our blink effect, we could easily do this multiple times in a turn. Seagate Oracle, when it enters the battlefield, lets us look at the top two cards of our library, and we get to put one into our hand and one on the bottom. And when Sun Titan enters the battlefield or attacks, we can return a permanent with CMC three or less from our graveyard to the battlefield. And Thassa's Oracle says when it enters the battlefield, we look at the top X cards of our library where X is our devotion to blue. We get to put up to one of those one of those cards on top of our library and the rest go on bottom in a random order. And it has the added effect of if X is greater than or equal to the number of cards in your library, you win the game instead. With how many cards we are going to be drawing throughout the game, it's very possible that our library gets low enough to where Thassa's Oracle becomes a win con. Next up, we're running a couple of creatures, like I said, that make our lives for our opponents a little bit more difficult. With Azor the Lawbringer, he is a Sphinx creature. When he enters the battlefield, each opponent cannot cast instants or sorcery spells during that player's next turn. Then he has an ability that says whenever Azor attacks, you can pay X, white, blue, blue, and if you do, you gain X life and draw X cards. We're then playing Agent of Treachery. When Agent of Treachery enters the battlefield, you get to gain control of target permanent. And at the beginning of your end step, if you control three or more permanents you don't own, you get to draw three cards. Something about Agent of Treachery is your opponents do not regain control of those cards when he leaves the battlefield. So if you can find a way of blinking him three times, you're going to start drawing three cards at the end of each of your turns. We're then playing Fiend Hunter, and when it enters the battlefield, we can exile any creature. And when it leaves the battlefield, we get to return that creature card to the battlefield under its owner's control. We're then playing Reflector Mage, which when it enters the battlefield, we get to return target creature and opponent controls to its owner's hand. That creature's owner cannot cast spells with the same name as that creature until your next turn. When Deputy of Detention enters the battlefield, we can exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls, and all other non-land permanents that player controls with the same name as that permanent until Deputy of Detention leaves the battlefield. Most of the time, we're only going to hit one thing with this, but if your opponent has a whole bunch of saplings or a whole bunch of vampire tokens or whatever, it's also going to exile all of those as well. Next, let's go over our blink engines. And what I mean by blink engine is creatures that have an ability that lets us blink multiple times with like an activated ability. So we've got Angel of Condemnation says Flying and Vigilance and we can pay two and a white to tap it and exile another target creature. And then we return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. We can also pay two and a white to tap and exert Angel of Condemnation to exile another target creature until Angel of Condemnation leaves the battlefield. And exerting it means that it will not untap during our next untap step. Next up is Aldrazi Displacer, which says for two and a colorless, we can exile another target creature. We then return it to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control. Just to note with this, we have to pay a colorless. We cannot use a colored mana to activate this ability. We then have Deadeye Navigator, which has Soul Bond, which says you may pair this creature with another unpaired creature when either enters the battlefield. They remain paired for as long as you control both of them. As long as Deadeye Navigator is paired with another creature, each of those creatures has pay one and a blue, exile this creature, then return it to the battlefield under your control. This also can combo with our Peregrine Drake, and we can make infinite mana. We're then playing Mist Metal Witch, which says for two white and a blue, we can exile target creature and we return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. And then we have Soul Herder and Thassa Deep Dwelling, each of which are going to trigger at our end step and blink a creature we control. Okay, like I said, this deck is at the same time a blink and a control deck, so we're playing some cards that are going to help us control what our opponents are doing on the stack and maybe wipe the board a couple of times. So we're going we're going to go over our counter spells first, and we're going to be playing Dovin's Veto, cannot be countered, and it can counter any non-creature spell. Counter spell, for two blue, counter spell is going to counter any spell. Negate is going to counter any non-creature spell. Render Silent is a powerhouse of a counter spell. We can counter any spell, and its controller can no longer cast any spells for the rest of the turn. We're then playing Spell Swindle, which can kind of be a haymaker because we can counter a spell, and we're going to create X colorless treasure artifact tokens, where X is that spell's converted mana cost, and each of those treasures have tapped to sacrifice sacrifice's artifact to have one mana of any color draw mana pool. This is kind of a Swiss Army Knife type of counter spell because it can counter anything, and it can ramp us a ton depending on what we're, what we're going to counter. And then we're playing Desertion, which costs three blue blue, and we can counter any spell. And if we countered an artifact or a creature spell, we can put that card into play as though we were the ones that cast that spell. Which is super good with Afara, because we can trigger Afara during somebody else's turn by countering their creature and playing it. We're then playing some kill spells slash creature removal spells, I'm going to say, because we're playing Reality Shift, Path to Exile, and Swords to Plowshares. Reality Shift is going to exile target creature, and its controller is going to manifest the top card of their library. Path to Exile is going to exile any creature and its controller can search their library for a basic land and put it into play. Tapped. And then Swords to Plowshares is going to exile any creature and its controller is going to gain life equal to its power. 
We're then playing Banishing Light and Dark Steel Mutation, which are some enchantments. Dark Steel Mutation is going to en enchant any creature, and that creature is going to be a 0-1 insect artifact creature with Indestructible, and it's going to lose all of its abilities. And Banishing Light says when it enters the battlefield, we get to exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls until Banishing Light leaves the battlefield. Next up for our big sweepers, we have Time Wipe, which is going to let us return a creature we control to our hand and then destroy all other creatures. Being able to bounce a creature back to our hand before we destroy everything is super huge because then we can get another enter the battlefield trigger off of one of our creatures. We're then playing Cleansing Nova, which has two modes. The first one is going to destroy all creatures, and the second one is going to destroy all artifacts and enchantments, depending on the situation and what we need. We're then playing Wrath of God, which is simply going to destroy all creatures and they cannot be regenerated. The last category that I've put in this deck is kind of stacks. We're not playing super mean stacks pieces, but we are playing some pieces that are going to help keep us alive longer so we can set up our set up our game better. This deck is a little bit slow, so we're really relying on these pieces to keep us in, a, in the game long enough to set up our engines. First off, we're playing Grand Abolisher, which is a human cleric that says during our turn, your opponents cannot cast spells or activate abilities or artifacts, creatures, or enchantments. So this is kind of a big shield that we're going to have up during our turn to keep us, to keep our opponents from interacting with what we're doing. We're then playing Authority of the Consoles, which is an enchantment that says your creatures your opponents control enter the battlefield tapped, and whenever a creature enters the battlefield under an opponent's control, we're going to gain a life. So this is going to stop maybe our opponent's big hasty creatures from swinging at us the turn they come out, and we're going to gain a life whenever one of their creatures do enter the battlefield. We're then playing Ghostly Prison, which is an enchantment that says creatures can't attack you unless their controller pays two for each creature that they control that's attacking you. So that, yes, our opponents can still attack us, but it's going to cost them extra mana, which they probably don't want to spend, and that'll disincentivize them from wanting to attack us. We're then playing Smothering Tithe, which says whenever an enchantment draws a card, that player may pay two. If that player doesn't, you get to create a colorless treasure artifact token with tap to sacrifice this artifact to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So again, this is an ability that our opponents probably are not going to want to pay for because they don't want to use their resources to keep us from gaining a little bit of value, and this is going to add up quick throughout the game. We're then playing Avon Mind Sensor, which has flash and flying, and if an opponent would search a library, that player searches the top four cards of that library instead. So this is going to hinder our opponents from tutoring perhaps for maybe the perfect answer to deal with what we're doing, or maybe preventing them from searching for a combo piece that's going to let them win the game before we're ready to stop them from winning. I'm sure you've noticed a little number next to all the categories as I've been talking about them. So that number is representing the number of each card in each category that I'm talking about. For example, this deck is playing six counter spells, five kill spells, and three sweepers. We're giving you the number of these cards because I've built this deck to work around these parameters with this number of interaction, this number of ramp spells, and this number of, of blink effects, etc, etc. And maybe some of the cards within these categories are a little bit out of your budget or maybe hard for you to acquire. You can actually substitute those cards for any card that you have that works within that category, and as long as you maintain that number, the integrity of the deck will stay very similar. Obviously, the deck will be increased if you put maybe a little bit more efficient cards that cost a little bit more money for in each of these categories, but by and large, the deck will, will run very similar if you maintain the numbers for each of those categories. Thank you guys so much for watching another deck deck. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you do end up building the deck, I hope it's really fun and you get to control your opponents and blink lots of things. Like I said earlier in the video, if you haven't subscribed, make sure you hurry up and do that so you don't miss any of our future deck decks that come out on Mondays and a lot of our future videos that we're going to be releasing. We're super excited to be bringing to you in the future more of our Duels of the Peaks, where we play a lot of the decks that we do deck decks on. And if you have any suggestions on decks that you'd like to see us play, let us know and we'd be happy to, to do that for you. Again, thank you guys so much and I hope you have a great day.